participants on. Thanks, Brian. I'm glad you're on the ball here today. <laughs> so uh, today is all about crop protection in the prairies, and we're gonna we got two excellent uh, speakers here to give us uh, an update on weed control and biological weed control, which I, I find fascinating. Um, just a reminder to everybody that how we're going to handle we're going to allow the presenter to, to go through their presentation and from start to finish and so if you have a question during that time please put it in the chat and after the presentation uh, is finished we'll go to the chat address all the questions that are in there but if you have additional questions that come to mind at that point please raise your hand and we'll um, acknowledge it and then you can unmute yourself and uh, we'll, we'll go through those questions as well. And as I said on Monday, I really encourage all of our participants to raise questions either in the chat or verbally, because I do believe it will help with your English without a, without a doubt. So today's program, Weed Control, we're gonna cover a whole list of different areas prairie weeds we're going to talk about weed resistance herbicide resistant crops one that we've been hearing about lately integrated management in this case weed management and then we're going to uh, have uh, information presented on biological weed control what are some of the target weeds that we're working on what are some biological control agents and then really what has to be done to kind of uh, evaluate them for their safety and for their environmental uh, sustain, sustainability. So we have two presenters, Dr. Bob Blackshaw and Dr. Rosemary de Klerk Float. Uh, both are with a federal government department, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. I know that Bob has been there for 30 plus years, I think he's 33 year career. And Rosemary, you've been there quite a while as well as a research scientist. Uh, Brian Carnahan is our host, and I will be a facilitator today. So with that, I'm going to stop screen sharing, ask Bob to share his PowerPoint slide. And as, as he does, I will read his bio. Dr. Bob Blackshaw recently retired from a 33-year career as a weed scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at Lethbridge, Alberta at the research station. He conducted research with the goals of furthering adoption of conservation tillage, developing more diverse cropping systems, and devising new integrated approaches to weed management. Dr. Blackshaw has published 250 scientific papers, numerous extension articles, and co-edited a book, he's an author, on innovative weed control strategy. His expertise was utilized by the Canadian International Development Agency in developing dry land cropping systems in China and by the FAO, Food <clears throat> Agriculture Organization, in setting environmental monitoring criteria for genetically modified crops. And we've talked about that already. Dr. Blackshaw was the chief editor of the Weed Science Journal for six years. I don't know what he did in his spare time. His contributions were recognized by receiving the Outstanding Research Award from the Weed Science Society of America. Please welcome Dr. Bob Blackshaw. Bob, please take it away. Okay, so I'm going to share screen. Is that what I'm going to do? Yes, please. Okay. See if we can get this going. So I'm having a hard time clicking on slideshow. It's uh, sort of covered up here somehow. There is the screen down at the bottom. 
bottom right hand corner if that's more visible okay maybe that will work too so okay you're i think that's good okay is that there now looks good okay good okay the fun the fun of technology so um so um so i just want to say hi everyone so um I, and, and i'm happy to participate in this today and um and we'll go through some information and then I really look forward to your questions and, and uh, discussion points as, as we move along. So uh, I retired uh, four or five years ago. So, um, so you know, science moves along and uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you sort of wonder if, if uh, some of my stuff is out of date um, already, but I don't think it is. And at least it'll give you an overview of, of, what, we've, uh, of what we've been doing the last, um, you know, 20, 30 years is what I'm going to talk about and where we are now. So we'll move forward. So this is um, this is a slide of, um, can I minimize some stuff here? I've got some people's faces on the right here. Can I get rid of those or not? Yeah, if you go to the top right hand, you're going to help them, Brian? It's just sort of blocking my slides a bit, so. If you go to the view, yeah. Uh, side by side speaker, I think we'll get rid of the gallery. I don't know if I see that. It's probably not too bad. It's just blocking one side of my screen a little bit. So, Bob, do you see to just to the right of your slide? Do you see a, a two parallel lines, vertical lines? No. Okay. Okay. Well, it's good for everybody else. It'll probably be. It'll probably work for me. So. So, um, uh, hopefully, the first. Uh, I'm just going to talk about our, our agricultural region for a couple of slides, and and I hope this isn't too repetitive. I know you've had previous speakers. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is that block of land that you see in, in Western Canada, in the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, Manitoba. So that's a big block of land, approximately 40 million hectare. And then you see our other agricultural areas are Ontario and Quebec um, to, to the east of the country there. And so they're, they're quite different. They're uh, lower latitude and higher rainfall and, and quite different from our region. So um, you'll see here that uh, precipitation, uh, we're a semi-arid area. Um, we receive only 350, 700 millimeter annual precipitation. So that's certainly a limitation to crop production in our region. And the other major limitation is just the length of our growing season, 90 to 130 for us three days. Um, I want to speak a little bit about conservation tillage. Um, it's been a movement, you know, started 30, 40 years ago. Um, but it's really changed how we grow crops in our region. So we're now at a stage of about 80% of our crops are grown under no-till and uh, it's really helped us in terms of soil erosion. And for us, that's mainly wind erosion is our problem. And um, some other nice things have happened is that um, we get uh, some snow trapping effects and it reduces evaporation. So those things together um, help us allow to have more soil moisture. And uh, what uh, that has allowed farmers to do um, is we have reduced fallow by 90%. Uh, we used to do that as a practice to conserve soil moisture, but now that is largely no longer needed. And uh, now we can grow uh, crops that require more soil water. So it's added a whole uh, crop diversification component, component to our cropping systems. This is a list of some of our major crops. Um, they're all pretty much spring planted annual crops. Uh, we grow a little bit of winter wheat, winter rye, winter triticale, but they're relatively small acreages. And uh, if, we, if we just sort of say where we're, where'd we stand 30 years ago, it was primarily cereals. But over the last 20, 30 years, we've had big increases in canola, field pea, lentil, dry bean. And uh, just recently, corn and soybean are moving into our region. These are the top 10 wheat species in our region. Um, you'll see number four, there's Canada thistle. That's a perennial weed. 
but all of the rest of them are summer annual weeds that are very well adapted to our summer, summer annual cropping system. Um, so that's sort of the, the niche that they occupy. And you'll see that I've put a, a bold on number two, wild oat. That's our, our most economic weed on the prairies. It's the one that causes the largest yield losses for us. And it's the one that we spend the most money on herbicides to try and control it. So a little bit about weeds. Um, one of the bad things about them is they're present every year. And that's uh, a little bit different from some of our disease issues or insect issues, which may be uh, a little bit more uh, cyclical. They come in for a few years and maybe disappear. And uh, certainly in the case of diseases in our, because we have a drier climate, uh, some of our disease issues are, are less in this region than they are in other parts of the world. So because of that, um, herbicides represent about 75% of the pesticide use in our region. So it's a dominant thing that farmers think about every year in their crop production systems. And so herbicides have been a huge benefit in many ways. Um, they've improved crop production and higher yields, and they've allowed adoption of conservation tillage, which has been hugely um, beneficial for us. But uh, no technology is 100% is uh, good. <laughs> There's always a downside. And so, you know, one of these is that the weed resistance issue is uh, increasing quite a bit in our region. And there's just generally an over-reliance on herbicides to manage weeds. This figure just shows the rapid increase in the number of herbicide resistant weeds in Canada over time. There weren't that many in the 70s and in the 80s. And then you can see that there was a big um, increase um, at, after that time. So a little, about, a little bit about the risk of weed resistance. Um, it's, it's partly a numbers game. <laughs> so um, it, if you have a distribution and density, if you have commonly occurring weeds over a wide geographic region and, and the, the numbers of those weeds are relatively high, it just increases your chance of getting resistance. And that's because naturally in the population, there will be a resistant gene that is present maybe one in a hundred thousand plants, one in a million plants, one in a billion plants. So just the more plants that you have out there, um, the greater chance there is to select for that resistant gene. And once you've selected for it, then it will increase in time, um, especially if you keep applying uh, those same herbicides. Genetic diversity is the same, uh, the same aspect, really. If you have a more diverse population, you have a greater chance of that resistant gene being there. And then seed production um, is important because once you have a resistant biotype, if it produces a lot of seed, then that just increases that population quickly um, over years. So this is just an example. We have uh, glyphosate resistant kochia, group two resistant kochia in our region. And when you have a plant that produces 10,000 to 25,000 seeds per plant, it can increase uh, very quickly. Um, in this uh, little diagram here, we're just trying to show that some herbicides are more prone to resistance than others. Um, and at the top there, we've got group one and group two, and we can talk about those a bit more. They're the DIMS and the FOPs and the saponolureas and the midazolone herbicides. And what we found um, just looking backwards um, over the years is that um, in as few as 10 applications or less, we can get um, resistant plants developing. And then if you go to the bottom row, you'll see that uh, number four is 2,4-D, MSPA dicamba, six is bromoxanol, nine is glyphosate or Roundup, and 10 is glufosinate or Liberty, a much lower chance, but not a zero chance. Um, and we uh, know that they usually take um, 20 or more applications to get resistance. So where do we stand in our region? Um, it's the group one and group two um, herbicide resistance is the most common. Um, if we were to look at wild oats, um, as I said, it's our most important weed. We apply the most herbicide to control it. So it's no surprise that we have the greatest resistance problem with it. So 
Um, in terms of group one resistance, it would be up around 65% of all the wild oats in our region are resistant to it. And group twos, it would be around 40%. So those are very high numbers and, and represent a big, big management problem for farmers. Uh, we have some other ones here listed as, as kochia, cleavers, and wild mustard in, in some regions. Those are primarily group two herbicides are resistant to. And then I'm sure you've all heard about glyphosate resistance. Um, the only weed that we have documented in Western Canada is kochia. Um, and that is a problem enough. We don't want any more. Um, in, in Eastern Canada, in the Ontario region, there's uh, four other species that are resistant to glyphosate and they're listed there, so. So herbicide, uh, herbicide resistant crops. So certainly uh, I would say a controversial area. Um, they are, have some positives and they have some negatives. Um, we don't have that many um, or we don't use that many in our region. So they are probably less of a negative than they would be in the US Corn Belt, for example. Liberty Link canola is quite popular in our region. So uh, Liberty Link canola and Roundup Ready canola, they, they dominate um, all of our canola market. So they would be 90, 95% of all our, our canola growing. In terms of Liberty, we don't use it in any other management way um, in our cropping system. And so because of that, um, it's, it's generally a positive in terms of managing re resistance because it gives us control and we're not overusing it. Um, and when it comes to Roundup, um, it, it's all about how frequently we use it. So if we were to grow Roundup Ready Canola only every third or fourth year in a rotation uh, with non-RR crops, then it, it, it's a neutral and maybe even be a positive in some cases. Uh, but where you really run into problems is when you have very tight rotations of uh, continue, uh, you know, Roundup corn and Roundup ready soybean growing in very tight rotations. And that's where you run, you really run into a problem. That's the story in the U.S. Corn Belt. It's also the story in Ontario. Clearfield crops, um, we, they're not widely grown, but there are uh, a few. Um, there is clearfield wheat and, um, and maybe the one that is sort of most interest to farmers would we have clear field lentil um, because lentil is, is a, not a very competitive crop with weeds and there's not a lot of other herbicides that can be used in it. So clear field lentil is, um, is of interest to farmers and is used. So now I'm gonna move along and talk about integrated weed management and nothing magical here, but I, I wanna try and go through some examples and just show you that there are other things that you can do in the, in the cropping system um, that will help manage weeds and, and it sort of reduces your reliance on herbicides. So it's just simply is combining several methods of weed control. And that's the same thing as any IPM strategy for insects or diseases. And we're just placing uh, emphasis a little bit differently in terms of inhibiting weed emergence and reducing their growth and minimizing uh, competition with crops. And we really hope that we can lower the population over time and, and lower our dependence on herbicides. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just talk about some different components of integrated weed management. And the first one is a diversified crop rotation. And it, I think it's the most important IWM or IPM strategy that, uh, that a farmer can employ. Um, because a lot of good things happen um, almost by accident. When you, when you grow different crops, you have various seed days, you have different fertilizer practices, you use different herbicides, or you use different fungicides, you harvest the crop at a different time. And all of those things sort of throw um, the wheat populations off balance and, uh, and keep their numbers down. A big plus for us over the years is we used to be dominated by spring cereals, wheat, barley, and oats. But now we have a lot more uh, oil seeds and pulses in our, in our rotations. We grow some winter crops and then also forages. We have a, a fairly um, large livestock, livestock population, especially in Alberta and parts of Manitoba. And so when you grow a forage, that also is a very good management tool in terms of managing reed rotations. But the most important thing in, in all these practices as we go through them 
they must be economically viable um, for the producers. So the, the farmer will only adopt some of these practices if they're uh, making money and certainly not losing money on doing them. And so I'm gonna you know, just stress that over and over. Here's an example of, um, of just what rotation can do for you. So this is an example of um, downy brome in winter wheat. And so downy brome is a winter annual weed in a winter annual crop. And if you grow continuous winter wheat, um, you can just see how quickly the downy brome populations increase in as few as you know, four or five years, we have these huge populations. Um, if you just go to a simple two-year rotation with winter wheat and spring canola, um, you can see that um, you know, the population remains at relatively low levels. And so that's, that's partly just a, a, a timing thing. Uh, the downy brome germinates in our fall in September and October. If you're planting a spring crop, you got a chance to control those uh, plants with tillage or with a herbicide and perhaps you have another herbicide option in canola and the whole timing is thrown off and you can uh, manage the weed a little bit better. Um, in these figures, we're showing uh, some yield data from uh, canola rotations and um, canola here is growing with, um, in rotation with uh, barley and field pea. And um, we collected a lot of different study, uh, inform, or I mean, a lot of different data in this study, but what I really what I want to point out is that, um, you know, yields increase uh, when you uh, have a, a decent crop rotation. And that, that's almost uh, universally true everywhere in the world. Um, so in this case, um, if you had compared with uh, continuous canola, if you had a two year rotation, it increased yield by 19 to 14%, nine to 14%, and a three-year rotation increased yield by 15 to um, 20, whatever is blocked out on my screen. But you can see the point. So, so farmers can um, you know, do things that help manage weeds and pests and also make more money. Higher crop uh, seeding rates, um, they can be quite valuable in terms of inhibiting weed germination and, and shading weeds. And so they're they're less productive and less competitive. And uh, a big thing that's happened for us is that our zero till systems, uh, we have more soil moisture and that has allowed us to increase seeding rates. And uh, certainly with some crops such as cereals that's been widely adopted, um, the seeding rate of our cereals is probably triple now what it was uh, 30 years ago. And uh, just to prove that we're sort of in, in a bit of a drought situation right now in the last couple of years, but before that time, our last really severe drought was in 2001 and 2002. And sort of uh, you know, a, a proof uh, to a lot of farmers is that their yields were equal or greater with the higher seeding rates in their cereals. And so that was a, that was a very positive thing just to reinforce that. Uh, here's an example of uh, some work I did uh, looking at increasing rates of wheat um, and how that would uh, suppress a stork spill over time. That's an er erodium species. And um, this was a, a four year study. So, um, and so you can see that at the low seeding rate, um, you can see this is stork spill seed in the seed in the soil seed bank. So we're we're taking soil cores and uh, determining how much seed is there. And so you can see that the numbers continually go down uh, with increasing seeding rates. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, but you also have to consider um, the wheat yield and the cost of doing that. And you'll see that our wheat yield tended to increase around, or I mean plateau, uh, increase and then plateaued around 150 or 200, um, 200 kilograms per hectare. So that's probably a rate that you would recommend. You don't necessarily want to go to that highest rate, just go to something that is still economical for the farmer and will have an effect on uh, suppressing weeds. Now, another area that I did some work and some other people uh, did some work, and it, it seems like a, a no, <laughs> no brainer statement to say that uh, weeds probably like fertilizer, but I don't know that we really realize how much some species um, respond to fertilizer. And if, that, and if that's the case, then we really need to think about, uh, okay, how do we fertilize our crops? So when do we do it? How do we apply that fertilizer um, to minimize uh, weed interference and improve uh, the crop? So this is just some examples uh, from the greenhouse here. And so 
Um, this is with increasing nitrogen rates, and you can see how dramatically uh, red root pigweed responds to increasing rates of nitrogen, and the same story for kochia. And this is a story with phosphorus and, and hairy nightshade. Um, so, so many weeds have um, adapted to our cropping system. I mean, they've been with farmers for hundreds of years in many cases. And so they have sort of a natural selection process. They've adapted to how we grow our crops um, how we manage our soils, how we fertilize them. And so it's not really a surprise that some of them respond uh, very high to uh, fertilizer like our crops do. So as I said, if that's the case, then maybe we need to think about how we can manage fertilizer to minimize uh, weed growth and, and at the same time improve crop growth. So, um, Surface broadcast nitrogen, in this case it would be urea, is just broadcast on the soil surface um, at the time of seeding, uh, maybe just before seeding or just after seeding. And when we talk about subsurface banded uh, fertilizer, we're applying it in a narrow band, um, approximately seven to 10 centimeters deep in the soil. And uh, what is that is doing is, um, in the case of broadcast, most of our weed seed is germinating at the soil surface or near the soil surface. And the weeds are almost having preferential access to the fertilizer um, over that of the crop. Um, and when we band it, um, we're doing just the opposite. So we're hopefully giving the crop preferential access to that fertilizer and, uh, and reducing weed competition over time. And so if you do this for one year, um, you may or may not see a difference. But if you start doing it for several years in a row, um, you can see some huge differences. And this is an example, like, you know, an extreme example, I guess, in a case, wild mustard was one of the most responsive weeds in our study um, to nitrogen. And so if we did something different with our nitrogen, uh, we had the one a, a big, large effect. But you can see there's a lot more yellow in one photo than the other. Um, silage is an, another very good practice um, because we're often um, harvesting the silage crop and the weeds before they produce seed. So then that just minimizes how much um, seed is going back to the soil seed bank and over time that can reduce weed population. So you, you know, for this to be effective, you have to have a market for that silage uh, which usually means that you on your farm or on a neighboring farm, um, you, you have to have livestock that will consume that forage. So if you're in a situation um, where that works for you, it can be very effective. Now intercropping is something that's done in many places of the world um, and, and successfully done in many places of the world. It's not hugely popular for us and, and the difficulty is with our mechanized farming systems it's sometimes you run into difficulties of seeding different crops or harvesting different crops or, or making the system work but um, some farmers are making it work and usually um, you um, will uh, have an opportunity to have reduced weed populations in, in, in crop mixtures as you'll see in this table and sometimes uh, you can result in higher yields as well. So there, so, so there is more work. I think it's even more popular just in the last four or five years than, than beforehand. So there's, there's work with pea and barley growing together um, and, and things like that. So another example is uh, some work we did with um, seeding uh, alfalfa, red clover, and winter pea uh, with winter wheat in the fall. And so our objective here was to, um, to suppress weeds. Um, and, uh, and especially in the case of these are all legumes, we were hoping to maybe get a little bit of nitrogen fixation that would uh, help out subsequent crops. So in this table, we're, we're looking at uh, some, some of the data collected over the years. And you'll see that the weed biomass um, was, uh, lower uh, in the intercrops um, than where we had no intercrop. So that was a, a positive. 
Um, and you can look at the legume biomass, you'll see that uh, we had red clover. We had sometimes had some winter kill of red clover, wasn't hardy enough in our climate when we, when we seeded it in late September, October, didn't have a lot of time to establish before uh, the cold winter temperatures. And then you'll see that winter pea um, did extremely well. Um, in fact, it did too well. So if you look at the yield data, you'll see that we actually had a yield loss or lower yield with winter pea. Um, but uh, the other two crops, uh, the winter wheat yield was, was okay. It was as good or, or perhaps even better. And, um, and then we were hoping to maybe get some benefits in terms of nitrogen. So this is what um, we would harvest winter wheat here in August. This is a picture of alfalfa uh, taken in probably late September. Um, so you'll see a stand there. Some farmers are interested in just keeping that as an alfalfa stand and using it for forage. What we did in our study is we uh, killed that alfalfa with glyphosate with Roundup at the end of October. And then the following spring, we measured how much additional nitrogen we had in our soil. And uh, what we uh, had was about an extra 40 to 50 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen for, the, for next year's crop. So um, a little bit about uh, green manure crops, uh, cover crops. Um, they're certainly um, universally used by organic farmers in our region, but there's also greater interest in, in conventional farmers um, in doing this. And I think, um, you know, the big, um, I think, was going to say the, the big plus or what farmers are most interested in is improving soil quality. Um, so reducing erosion, improving soil health, uh, feeding soil microbes, um, all the good things we do for, for soil quality. And, uh, and of course, if we can get some, uh, you know, nitrogen into our system, then that helps in terms of economics. So the first example I'm going to show is, um, is a fall planted cover crop before a spring planted cash crop. So for us that um, I'm gonna show you an example with winter rye, it, it possibly could be winter traily, winter triticale. They both survive our, our winters quite well and are, you know, grow vigorously and, and have weed suppressing ability. So, um, so we did some work with that. And so this is a picture, uh, we planted our, our winter rye in, um, it probably would have been towards the middle or end of September. Um, it, it, it establishes, it survives the winter, uh, resumes growth quite early in the spring, so it would be right around now, so uh, probably towards the end of March, early April, it would resume growth. And we, so we just let it grow until around the middle of May, late May. Um, we sprayed it out with Roundup, and then we went in one or two days later and seeded our dry beans directly into it um, before, before the crop had a chance to sort of lodge and fall down on itself, which complicates seeding. It's way easier to go in right away and seed the crop and, and then see what we got. And so then this is a picture. You can see that we got pretty good emergence of, of the dry beans in that stand. You see the ground cover we've got there. So it minimizes erosion. Um, we get some weed suppression out of that, uh, conserve some soil moisture, and, and it actually worked um, pretty well for us. I guess uh, what I will say is that um, emergence of dry beans was uh, five to seven days later in that system, um, but they tended to catch up um, over the growing season, and uh, we really didn't see a delay in maturity um, by harvest time. So um, I'm getting close to, to the end of things here. I just want to wrap up. I, I've shown a number of examples of, of things that, that can be done. And, and actually, you know, many of them farmers are doing right now. But I just want to talk about, um, you know, when you put these systems together, it's not just a one-off or a one-year thing. And, and you hope to get um, a lot of good things happen out of it. So. So what I'm saying here is if you can start combining several good practices, um, you'll have a larger effect. And if you can start doing those practices over multiple years, you will have even a larger effect. So the first example I'm going to show is from uh, US Great Plains uh, region. 
And they looked at uh, various combinations of competitive cultivars, higher seeding rate, narrow row spacing, and uh, subsurface banded fertilizer. So sort of similar to the example I've shown already. And this is what they found. So um, on the y-axis here, you'll see this is percent weed reduction um, in, in winter wheat and in sunflower. And on the, across the, uh, the bottom here, it's the number of integrated weed management practices. So if you did one practice, um, you know, you can say a higher seeding rate or one just by itself, you get a little bit of weed suppression. If you do the second, you get a little bit more effect. And if you do three all together, um, then sometimes you can have quite a large effect. And so we, we found that in our studies here in Western Canada, just not myself, but other people have been working on this for years, is you have to do uh, really more than one good practice to, to have a large effect. So in the case of sunflower, why it was so large there, they went to narrow row seeding and subsurface banded fertilizer. And those, those two things were the most important in sunflower. So the next example is some work that we did looking at this multi-year aspect of, uh, of doing some of these good uh, practices. And so this study, um, I think we conducted this at six locations across Western Canada. Uh, one of the locations was at my site here in Lethbridge. And so what were our factors? We had continuous barley, which we know is not a good practice, but we have it in there for comparison. And then we had a barley, canola, barley, pea rotation. Uh, we looked at semi-dwarf or tall cultivars, so that uh, semi-dwarf is less competitive than a tall cultivar. We had two different seeding rates of all of our crops. And then herbicide rate, uh, we had a quarter, a half, and a 1x. And we had these lower uh, rates of herbicide just to help us demonstrate um, the benefits of these other integrated weed management practices. And so the important thing is here is that uh, we apply these treatments to the same plots year after year uh, for a five year period. And so we're looking at, okay, what's the effect not only in one year, but what's the effect in five years? And so this is sort of the, the gist of the, of the story here. Um, this is looking at uh, weed biomass. Um, and you'll, you know, if you look at the box in the top right hand corner, that sort of tells a story. If we went to a short to a tall cultivar, um, so that was really going from a semi-dwarf to a tall uh, cultivar in, in some cases, um, we got a, a, a two-fold reduction in weeds. If we increased the seeding rate from 200 to 400, we got a 3x reduction. If we had both those factors, we got an 8x reduction. And if we had all three factors, we had a 70x um, reduction. And so the real, sort of the overriding thing here is that 70x thing is all about crop rotation. Um, so it, it just drives home the point of how important crop rotation is in terms of managing um, weed populations and, and lots of other pest populations. And then this is the yield data from that study. And you'll see um, there we have the, you know, on the left, we have continuous uh, barley and then on the right in rotation. And so all we're really just trying to show here is that, um, you know, it may cost you more money to increase your seeding rate or it may cost you more money to do some other integrated weed management practice. But most of the time, that will be uh, more than compensated by uh, higher increases in yield and in some cases even better crop quality. So, so this is my last slide here. I'm going to uh, wrap things up. Um, so it, it's fine to you know do do all this work on the on the practices, but um, you know when you when you get out and speak with farmers and and to get it widely adopted you you have to do a lot more than that of course and so you need to try and put these various weed management practices together in workable systems at, at the farm level and and i say here you need to understand the agronomics which is what we try and do in all of our research but the economics is just as important is probably more important and so in some of our work we had an ag economist we had dr elwin smith 
that took all of our data and, and looked at the economics of these studies and, uh, and was able to point out, yes, you know, it was beneficial, or in some cases it's not, it was actually a negative. And of course, that's, that's, you need to know those things as well. And then finally, just uh, you know, demonstrations involving farmers and their field scale equipment uh, can really help uh, transfer technology as well. So I think the bottom line is you, you just have to uh, you know, show, the, show people the possibilities and then help them um, integrate it into their farms with their equipment, their crops, their rotations, and their financial system. So I'm gonna leave it there. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay, so are we good now? Uh, Rick, were you gonna go through some of the questions in the chat? Gotta unmute Rick. So I think maybe Rick's on the phone. So there was a question from Tulio. Uh, what is the difference between herbicide resistance and tolerance? Um, there really is no difference. So when, when the herbicide resistant crops first came out, we, we talked about herbicide tolerant crops. Um, but then we just sort of changed the terminology and we called them herbicide resistant crops. So, so there's uh, essentially no difference in terms of like a Roundup Ready canola. Uh, I mean, when we talk about natural tolerance, so that's a different story. So if we say, okay, wheat is tolerant to dicamba herbicide, um, that's, that's a natural tolerance. But when we talk about... Um, genetically engineered crops and um, and they're in increasing the you know putting tolerance into um, a crop such as a, a roundup ready corn for instance then uh, it, it, they're they're the same no difference thank you for that um, question here from victor or vitor what are the main crops that have clear field technology what are the main crops yes in our region, we have clear field wheat, we have clear field canola, and we have clear field lentil. And, and none of them are grown very widely. So clear field canola is, uh, you know, less than 5%, maybe only one or 2%. Um, there's a little bit of clear field wheat. And as I said, probably the most uh, one of interest to farmers is the clear field lentil, just because, um, because there aren't many other good herbicides that we can use in lentil. Thank you. Uh, another question from Tulio. What are the most frequent symptoms of phototoxicity due to the application of herbicides on canola? On phytotoxicity? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess it depends on the mode of action of the herbicide. So each herbicide has, um, you know, acts on a, a different enzyme in the plant. Um, and then that uh, will uh, lead to a different symptom. So if we were to think of group two herbicides, it's usually a, um, a chlorosis or yellowing of the leaves and a stunting of the growing point. So that herbicide translocates to the growing point of the plant and kills the growing point. And, it, and, it, and actually some of the leaves can stay healthier for a while, but the growing point is dead and it will no longer grow. If it was glyphosate, there would be overall lighter green color of the plant. And then over time, um, the leaves would, would turn brown and, and die. So, so it's very much dependent on the um, on the mode of action of the herbicide. Thank you. 
Uh, another question, how, to, how do you increase the competitive capacity of the presented crops to the prejudice of weeds? Could you repeat the question? Uh, Tulio, do, do you maybe want to re-ask that question? Sure, can I say in here? So uh, what's the strategies you use to avoid the herbicides like uh, the density of the plants or something like that? Well, all, <laughs> it, it's sort of all the examples that I've given, but um, if you have a, competitive, a relatively competitive crop, like our cereals are relatively competitive, uh, wheat, barley, oats, actually oats in the ranking of competitibility, it would be oats and then barley and then wheat. Um, and we plant them in relatively solid, you know, they're in solid stands. Uh, our row spacing would be, um, you know, I guess, you know, eight to 14 inches. So, I mean, you can translate in that into centimeters, but, you know, and they're relatively uh, vigorous uh, plants. So they uh, uh, can close in, close the canopy quickly. So, I mean, that, I think that's what you want. You want to close the canopy quickly enough so that the crop is shading out the weeds. And so if you can suppress the, the earliest weeds that germinate um, somehow, then um, the later germinating weeds have very little chance if you have a very thick crop that is shading out sunlight. And so early on, um, weeds compete for moisture and nutrients very, uh, you know, very strongly, but as the season goes along, um, the easiest way to suppress weeds is to stop them from getting sunlight. Thank you for that. Uh, here's another one uh, from Vitor about intercrop. How are farmers planting and harvesting the two different crops? Yeah, so sometimes um, they're making two passes when they seed the crop. Um, and other times they are, uh, if it's an air seeder and they're blowing the seed out in tubes, they'll, they'll mix it together and just seed it together. And then other times they may have one row of one crop and then the next row will be a different crop. So it depends on the seed size. Um, and you know, if they're both seeds that you can plant at the same depth in the soil, then you can make that work. If one is deep seeded, one shallow seeded, you probably need to make two operations. And then when it comes to harvest, um, what works most successfully if you have crops that have the close to the same maturity. So if, if they both mature in 100 days of, of our growing season, um, and, and if we were to look at peas and barley, that would be the case, that would be true. So they're both mature around the same time. And then, and then the, what you do with your uh, combine, uh, your harvesting equipment, is you have to uh, make adjustments there so that you're um, thrashing the seed out of the plant, but not, uh, not cracking the seed. So you may have to open up your uh, cylinder a bit and your concaves and uh, make uh, adjustments there. Um, and you harvest them together. And then they might be used um, for feed uh, to livestock, just the way they are, peas and barley together. Or you would take them and then you would separate the seed and, uh, and sell them separately. Thank you. Uh, one last question for you. In years of low rainfall, uh, intercrop causes, does intercrop cause moisture problems for the following crop? Um, I, I, I think I think it does. Uh, I mean, it can. So um, I think that's true in our driest areas or our dry years when we grow a, a cover crop um, or an intercrop, we're potentially using up more moisture than just if we just grew the crop by itself. Um, and so that is a concern and that is a bit of a limitation. So if we were just look at, at where um, cover crops or intercrops, definitely cover crops and probably intercrops, they're more widely grown in Manitoba um, that has a fair bit more rainfall than the drier parts of Saskatchewan and Alberta. 
So, so it is a concern. It's something that farmers think about all the time. Thank you very much, Bob. That was a great presentation. Enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, now we're going to turn it over to Rosemary, who's our next presenter. And Rosemary, I'm able to uh, to share your presentation. Um, so I will load that up and uh, I'll see if I can get give control of it over to you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, highlight you. There we go. And let me share the screen. And now I can't find the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want me to try one more time? Sure, why don't you try one more time? Hello everyone. Uh, just to tell that Rick uh, said that the internet is just gone and uh, he hope everybody is still connected and carry on by us, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hello, it worked. Great, perfect. Yay. <laughs> uh, so hello everyone. Oh, I guess you should introduce me first though. <laughs> uh, sorry, Rose, we don't have your bio. Rick is off. Oh. Please introduce yourself and sure. carry on there. Sure. So um, so yeah, uh, similar to Bob, I, I'm a research scientist um, that, um, yeah, that's, that's been at uh, the Lethbridge Research and, um, and Development Center since the beginning of my career. And uh, I, this is my 30th year in my position. Um, and so I'm, a, I'm an insect plant ecologist, I guess that's what you could call me, uh, that studies classical weed biological control. And uh, what I thought I would do, given the shorter period of time I have, I'm not going to get into a lot of specifics with, uh, with data, but I just want to give you an overview of what our project is all about. And, um, and uh, yeah, introduce you to some of the uh, insects in this case that we use for biological control uh, with a bit of history, a couple of examples of success stories. And, um, and then, you know, the process that's involved, which is a rather long process of getting these agents uh, approved for release in Canada. So to begin with, um, yeah, I just want to define what classical weed biological control is. Well, it's the use of, of an invasive plant's natural enemies. Uh, we mostly use insects, but it can involve uh, host specific pathogens. And these are from the plant's place of origin and uh, they're meant to reduce the, the invasive plants populations to below damaging levels. And these are levels of uh, either or both economic and, and environmental concern. Now, the reason why we're using these foreign agents is that, is that the, uh, the weeds of, of interest or of concern have arrived here in North America uh, without their natural enemies. And most of them arrived during, um, during settlement, um, agricultural se settlement, um, you know, in the 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, these uh, plants have hitchhiked to Canada on their own and, uh, and for various reasons have uh, taken a liking to our environment, environments and climate. Um, they've mostly have come from climate equivalent areas overseas. Most of our, our invasive plants come from Europe, but uh, also Asia or Eurasia. And uh, once they get established, they don't have anything to keep them under control. Like in their place of origin, they're not weeds or they're not invasive. So, so we're, we're trying to use a natural method of, of control by reuniting these uh, host specific natural enemies with these weeds um, and uh, we're using applied ecology with and the science that's involved is understanding that interaction between between the um, the organism that we've released and, and the and its invasive host 
um, and manipulating that interaction to achieve the outcomes that we want of reducing their levels. And uh, we only choose really host specific organisms for, that we test thoroughly over many years. Um, and, uh, and if they uh, establish and do well, like you're talking about an organism that is targeted just to the weed of interest. So other weeds don't get controlled um, in the process. And, uh, but if they establish well, uh, uh, you, you're looking at long-term control when it works, uh, where you don't need to reapply the agents once they're established. Uh, and, they, uh, and ideally they go off looking for just their host weed once they've controlled patches of, uh, of, this, of these plants that we're trying to control. Uh, that drives down the cost, the total cost of weed control. But I want to point out that these weeds aren't, um, aren't in annual crops, like what Bob was talking about mostly. Um, and mo the majority of them are perennial plants. Um, and uh, they, yeah, biocontrol tends to work in areas where there's a very little disturbance. So like in an annual crop situation, there's way too much disturbance going on to allow these organisms to establish, build up a number and have the impact we're looking for. So uh, another reason why we use biological control is that there's many areas where these weeds have invaded, um, where you just simply can't use use herbicides um, where it's not permitted uh, to spray herbicides close to water, for instance, like in this case is a spotted knapweed in the foreground. And these weeds can go into uh, a lot of our natural areas uh, in our wilderness areas where it's just not easy to, to get to them to spray or control either. And uh, for, for instance, like we do a lot of our work on native rangelands which are quite expansive in area and over uh, variable terrain where it's just difficult to, uh, even to drive or get to these locations to spray. And it would be way too costly and uh, the herbicides used would also uh, damage the native uh, forages that, uh, that are valued for, for cattle grazing, for instance, in Western Canada. Um, so yeah, uh, biocontrol is really the only option, but, but it is one tool in the toolbox of, uh, of other options. And I think we need to do more work on the integrated approach of looking at how we could maybe use herbicides and cultural methods of weed control um, together with biocontrol. And, and that's a whole area of research. Uh, we just don't have enough researchers to look at all these other possibilities. But um, a brief history of our program, we began in 1951. So over 70 years, we've been in operation doing research on, on the, uh, controlling these plants using, using biological control. This is a, a full list of uh, the common English names of these weeds that we've targeted over time. And um, yeah, and we have like for the longest while, we only had a couple of researchers full time. Uh, for all of Canada. We're a national program uh, and we've always been housed within, um, within Agriculture Canada um, uh, and uh, helping people across the country control their weeds with, uh, with biological control. So of those um, biocontrol agents that we've released, um, and again, the majority are insects from overseas, but um, but we've targeted 34 invasive plant species over time and I've released 86 mo mostly insect species uh, intent intentionally after a lot of testing and approval uh, to control these plants. Some of these plants have had uh, several or many uh, biocontrol agents that have been released, have been released to, to control them. Um, and these uh, organisms are meant to work in conjunction, attacking different parts of the plant, for instance, to try to bring it, uh, or, or in the attempt to bring it, the weeds under control. But of the ones uh, that we have released, uh, about 68% of these uh, biocontrol agents have uh, become established permanently in Canada on, on their host plants and are now part of our, uh, our fauna. 
And of those, 46% um, of the agents that have established, have had, have demonstrated uh, some level of impact on their weeds. So we consider that a, actually a success. I'm going to just talk about a couple of well-known uh, success stories, especially uh, on the prairie in in, the, in Western Canada. But um, uh, I guess this would be in the 1970s. Uh, one of my predecessors, uh, uh, Dr. Peter Harris, was involved with this successful program against leafy spurge, which is um, yeah, which is a, a serious rangeland weed um, and it like it's it forms these really dense stands that uh, choke out or outcompete uh, other forage species, other uh, like native species on native rangeland, and these areas are uh, used for cattle grazing. And if the number of the weeds get of leafy spurge gets too high, uh, the cattle just simply don't graze at all, even if there's grass in around these patches. So these uh, little beetles, they're flea beetles, uh, were brought over from Eurasia and, uh, and released against leafy spurge. And uh, soon after release, um, what, what was noticed, and it still is uh, the case today, is that they reduce the, the uh, reproductive capacity of these plants by reducing the number of flowering stems. And, and if, there's, uh, you know, if there are fewer flowers or fewer seeds, and a, a lowered capacity for the for the weed to spread to new areas, and uh, also the beetles over time uh, can cause um, uh, plant mortality or weed mortality. And the uh, now it's interesting because if you release them where the stake is, uh, then within six years you start seeing these these areas where native grass is coming in or native plants are coming in but the spurge is disappearing. And that's due to the feeding uh, by the progeny of these beetles. They, their larvae feed on the roots. And uh, it, it takes many years for, for patches, big patches to be controlled. Um, but the thing is, is that something is working in areas that normally have no, uh, no recourse for control of these weeds. Then I'll, I'll talk about uh, a project I was involved with when I started my program. Uh, well, I guess in this case, it was about 25 years ago I got involved with this project. But, um, but it also involves another uh, 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 weed of uh, native rangelands, uh, hound's tongue, it's called. And this weed is highly toxic uh, to cattle and, um, and horses as well, and other ungulates, including wild ungulates. Um, but uh, yeah, the cattlemen really wanted control of it. This weed comes from Europe. Um, and so we went overseas to try to find something that we could use. The first agent um, is this little weevil up in the upper uh, uh, right-hand corner. And uh, its larvae feed within the roots of hound's tongue. You can see the little white larva in a cracked open root of hound's tongue. But, by, but you can get roots just full of these larvae that uh, uh, basically prevent the plant's ability to take up water and nutrients from the soil. It can kill individual plants and reduces its ability to uh, also to outcompete other vegetation. After nine years of um, testing the, the agent, and I'm gonna talk about the testing a bit as what's involved, but it's the test for the safety of releasing it so that it, uh, the agent doesn't feed on things that we don't want it to, uh, to feed and damage or feed on and damage. Um, but it was first released in Canada. I was uh, the person that made the first release in 1997 in Southern British Columbia, but it has become very successful. I would say it's, I, I think I'm prejudiced, but I think it's the best example of how biocontrol classical weed biological control can be uh, very effective. And uh, within a year, I knew we had a winner because we were seeing this sort of damage. Uh, the upper photograph is a hound's tongue rosette, a young plant that's uh, been heavily damaged by feeding by this weevil. 
and the lower uh, one is of, a, of what the plant should look like if it had no feeding whatsoever by, by, the, by the weevil in this case. So uh, actually within two or three years, we got consistent um, control of large dense patches of this weed uh, to the point um, that we don't need to uh, reapply biocontrol and it's working on its own. The weevil is very good at finding its host plant. Uh, like it can fly and seek out uh, isolated patches that are several kilometers away. And, um, and yeah, very quickly it cleaned up um, the, the patches of hound's tongue, especially in, in British Columbia, but now in south, southwestern Alberta as well, in the foothills, uh, uh, foothill prairies and, uh, and uh, rangelands of southern Alberta. Uh, we also uh, developed methods of uh, mass production of this weevil so that people could get the biocontrol agent more quickly. And uh, that was a unique story as well. I'm not going to get into, but we developed methods of growing house tongue like a crop and uh, seeding the weevils in the crop, letting them go through several generations over a couple or several years and then harvesting them for redistribution to, to others. And as a result of that program, you know, like I don't think biocontrol is a problem weed any longer. But just to, to summarize what's involved in getting an agent like Mogoloni's Crucifer, that weevil, approved for release in Canada, uh, we have to do a lot of pre-testing. It's re highly regulated, our regulator in Ottawa reviews, like it's a science-based um, re review. And uh, we, we put a lot of science and time into these petitions for the agent's release in Canada giving them, uh, giving uh, reviewers, science reviewers, a heap of information on uh, the host range of the insects involved or the organisms involved that we want to release. And, uh, that, and that involves running these tests. Most of these tests are, are done, conducted overseas in Europe. Um, there's, a, there's a research institute in, um, in Switzerland um, in a not-for-profit not organization, CABI, um, which has entomologists and pathologists uh, conduct these tests. But we send plant material, like seeds of plants that are native or, uh, of concern that may be a uh, host to these insects, so they have to be tested. Or, you know, even crop, crop plants that may be closely related to the weed that may be at risk. So, um, so our tests uh, focus on, especially since we choose uh, organisms that are known to be host specific based on the European and uh, Eurasian literature, uh, but we still have to test uh, to make sure. So we tend to uh, fixate on testing those plants that are, that are phylogenetically, uh, genetically very closely related to the weed that, that we're targeting. But the no choice test is basically caging individual plants, uh, either of the plants that we're concerned about, but also the, the host weed as controls. But we're, we're basically telling the insects, uh, if we're testing insects, you know, either feed or develop on these plants or die. And often if, they, if the plant is not a host, they will, they will die, they do not recognize it as food. Um, but the no choice tests uh, really give us an idea of the physiological host range, what these insects can feed and develop to adult stage on. Uh, but the multiple choice tests is, they're run uh, either in cages using the different species together with the weed where the insect has to make a choice, or they're often run right outdoors in the open uh, where, they're, where the insect's ecology kicks in and, uh, and they, uh, they hone, the, I guess they cue into other things than just the host plant, uh, the, including the environment that these plants grow in. But, uh, but we're looking in that case at their preference. And often the preferences, uh, the range of plants that they feed on, that range is a lot narrower when they're given a whole choice uh, of uh, species 
to, to look at and find. Um, now at Lethbridge, we, uh, we also have this beautiful facility that was built almost, almost uh, 20 years ago now, um, but it's a quarantine, a special quarantine just to hold insects. And uh, that allows us, uh, like these are insects that we house in there are quarantined, they're not allowed out at all, but we can get uh, these insects that are, um, that are the whole promise for uh, biocontrol of various weeds. We can get them shipped from Europe in uh, airtight boxes and, uh, and then study them, rear them and study them in our quarantine facility. And that allows us to, that, to get to know the insects really well and how to handle them and, and aspects of their biology and ecology that will prove useful down the road when we, you know, when we advise others on how to use these biocontrol agents if they get approved for release. And um, currently, like we're, I'm involved with a number of new projects. These are new weeds. Um, of concern that we've added to our list. And uh, we have new biocontrol agents, the, you know, all except the top one for Russian olive, which is a, a, a plant feeding mite. Um, all of them are in our containment facility, uh, been imported over just the past couple of years. And we're also helping Europe with host specificity testing or host range testing as well because we have these semi-natural areas like our greenhouse that we can run these experiments. And, uh, and just from looking at the, uh, the lineup of uh, organisms we're looking at, or uh, arthropods in this case, um, yeah, there's, there's a full range. Like we're looking at a mite, we're looking at a moth uh, for another weed and these flies for another and another little weevil. Weevils are the best though. They're pretty hardy insects to work with. And uh, here's another weevil that uh, this is a project where we obtained approval to release an aid, this agent uh, against another weed of both rangelands, but also of uh, perennial and annual props is yellow toad flax, Linaria vulgaris. And, um, and so, yeah, it occurs right across Canada. It's a problem in strawberries in Nova Scotia on the, on the East Coast is a problem like I said, on rangelands, but also in barley and alfalfa on the prairie. But, um, but we thought we would try this new agent. Um, I think it's a hairy weevil, and, uh, but it lays its eggs in the rapidly growing shoots of its host plant in spring. And um, it somehow tricks the plant to grow this house for it. It's, a, it's called a gall. It's a very fleshy structure that's lined with uh, nutritive tissues that the, uh, the, the larvae of this insect uh, then uh, capitalize on, on the plant. Um, it draws all these nutrients and, the wa and water that it uptakes from the soil uh, to feed the larvae and thereby whatever is going to the gall development and the larval development uh, does not, it gets shunted away from re reproductive and uh, vegetative growth of the weed. So it reduces its impact, uh, you know, in various uh, habitats and situations, crop situations. The insect is, insect, uh, this little weevil is very host specific. It, it won't even develop galls on a closely related weed, uh, Dalmatian toe flax. But uh, the, yeah, the, the, I mentioned the life history of the insect. But it was first released uh, after petitioning and many years of testing in 2014. And then the first releases uh, between that time and 2016 were made across Canada. And we're now following those releases to see how well the insect has established and whether it's building up a number. Uh, because you need both of those before you can look at whether or not they're having an impact on the weed. So I think there's a uh, yeah, there's some really good potential. And uh, also tied in with looking at, you know, looking at the impact and, and uh, how to use the insect. Uh, we also are asking questions that are relevant in today's uh, situation with, you know, with the increase, increasing effects of climate warming. Uh, we're 
we're expected to get more and, and you know, more uh, uh, greater number and the more severe drought incidents, especially on the prairie. So the question is, you know, how, uh, how, is, how are these droughts going to affect the efficacy of the insect, uh, its interaction, interactions with its host and uh, whether it can survive uh, the droughts itself, or if it does, what kind of impact can it have on its host? So we're running these experiments currently in the greenhouse and out in the field where we're looking at different soil moisture levels, um, running from dry to extremely moist. And uh, we're also looking at different genetic strains of, of this agent because some strains might be more uh, pre-adapted to drought, for instance, than others. Uh, these insects come from Serbia um, or Eastern Europe. And, um, you know, I imagine they're going through similar sort of uh, uh, climate change scenarios there as well as here. But, uh, but we need to know these things so that we can advise people where best to release them and where they will be effective. So that's all I have um, <laughs> within the time I have. But uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, Rose. Uh, Rick asked me to fill in since he's having some communication problems, obviously, with his computer. So, so thanks so much. I know a couple of our participants from South America that were particularly interested in biocontrol aren't with us today or aren't able to be with us today. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hector on last week covered off some of the, the questions regarding uh, insect biocontrol. So that was that was mm. quite helpful. But uh, Good. Uh, I, I just I think one of the questions that you know usually we get asked is the impact of climate change, and you know we we've got maybe ten minutes left if uh, mm. if people have any questions. But uh, could you could you call? I know you mentioned climate change, Rose, but you know, I think a lot of us are concerned about potential mm -hmm. impact of climate change on some of these species. And is there going to be greater demand for, because again, people are concerned about pesticides and insects. Right, and, right. And biological yeah, that's, control is a good option. You know? Yeah, and, yeah, and I, I, that I failed to, uh, to mention too, the, like the whole intent of using biocontrol or another intent is to reduce pesticide use and, uh, or herbicide use in the environment. And, you know, like, like you said, Wayne, you know, like that, uh, if we relate that to the, you know, the carbon emissions associated with applying these uh, pesticides, uh, that's another good reason to re you know, reduce their use in the environment. Uh, I still think that pesticides have a role to play, especially when a new, a new highly invasive uh, and damaging weed comes on the scenes. Um, before it gets a foothold, hold, uh, the, the, uh, the focus is on finding it and eradicating the small patches before they get expansive. But weed biocontrol is useful for when you just don't have any other recourse and the weeds are so far spread that there's no way you can use uh, pesticides to get them under control again. But you're right, I think there is a greater interest in biocontrol of recent. And especially when people start seeing how effective uh, biocontrol can be, especially in rangeland and natural area situations. Like it's, we have some really good success stories that we've built over the years. That's great. Um, yeah. Just and to then, add, uh, you have to have a lot of patience, uh, not only as a researcher trying to get these biocontrol agents approved, and out and working because it can take, I'm not kidding, it can take up to 20 years before you know that a biocontrol agent's working uh, well. And um, hopefully it works quicker, like with the hound's tongue story. But, uh, but uh, you know, I think the people that are receiving these agents, we really drill home to the, uh, drill in the message that, you know, be patient because sometimes these agents just, just take a while to work. Any other questions for, for Rose? Um, Rose, it's Fran. Hi, how hi, are you? Hi. Oh, good to hear you. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I'm I'm monitoring uh, Maria, but I have a question. Um, they're using goats here down in the river valley, are they not? For 
some I, control? I think so. I, I'm not sure if it's in Lethbridge. I know they're using goats in uh, city parks in Calgary. They're actually uh, using them down in the in the Indian Battle Park. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, uh, th that could be effective as well, mm -hmm. as long as um, as long as uh, the buyer control agent. Like I, I think we can uh, combine. Uh, you know, in this case, integrate different control methods. Uh, so it's about knowing uh, when to bring the goats out in, in relation to uh, the life cycle of the insect involved as well. But one thing I'm finding out with that, uh, that yellow toflax agent that produces those big fleshy galls. Uh, last summer, my uh, experiment I set up on the prairie uh, north, north of here, um, a native prairie north of here. Uh, because of the severe drought we had last summer, toad flax was about the only thing that remained green in the, and growing in the pasture. Mm -hmm. And the cattle that were put out, they went and ate the toad flax. And I think they ate the galls and the insects with, uh, with the toad flax. So there's an example where, you, you, like, you know, you have to be aware of how these other, other things can interact with the living organisms you're trying to uh, establish and, and, uh, and yeah, get, in, get to increase in numbers so they can have an impact. Thanks, Rose. Yeah. yeah. Brady, do you have a question, Brady? Uh, hi there. Um, hi. My, my question was um, just to confirm for the first part, um, these insects that sometimes you release to help control a, an invasive weed, are they also a, an introduced insect or are they yes. uh, sometimes a local? Oh, uh, no, they're uh, everything we do in the uh, classical, uh, the classical part of biological control in this case is going back to the home country and range of, of the uh, plant to find the natural enemies it evolved with overseas, right? Uh, and so that's all we're working with. We're working okay. with the introduced foreign organisms. And that's why we have to do all this testing to get approval for release of, of these new organisms into our environment. Because we don't, we don't want the organisms to become uh, invasive as well. Right. right. That, yeah, that was my question. You mentioned they were very host specific uh, yes. sometimes. And is there negative long term effects that uh, are a major concern or is that uh, quite um, minimal because they're host specific? Uh, yeah, we only choose those that are host specific. We, we will not choose something that can feed on a broad range of, of uh, distantly related plants, which some insects can. And so, uh, and that's why, you know, it can take uh, a decade or more of testing to show what they're capable of doing. And then it's up to the researchers, uh, like we're arm's length for the review. Uh, other people review the petitions and make that decision. Uh, you know, what are the risks and what are the benefits of using biocontrol? Those are the things that they ask. So we, we give them it all, we give them, all the information we have on the weed and what kind of impacts the weeds are having on our, uh, you know, either economic or environmental. And, uh, and then all the information we, we have gathered over time on the insect as well. So, you, you know, we, um, we give our, our recommendation, but it really is up to uh, others to make that uh, final decision and, and the regulatory agency. Yeah, um, you know, I'm not saying that these insects can't feed on other things, but if they do, they're very closely related. They're plants that are very closely related to the weed. And uh, we actually, um, you know, give uh, predictions on what may happen based on that as well. We even look at if an insect can develop on, on uh, a, another plant species that we value. Uh, for instance, uh, we do the pre-testing to see if they would have any adverse impact on, on, on those plants as well. So there's a lot of study studies that go into these petitions. See, Rick is back, joined us. Welcome, Rick. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't out in cyberspace. I was <laughs> in the dark here in the basement, so I'm not 
<laughs> the Wi-Fi just went down, and Telus uh -huh. Telus was able to reboot it for me. So it's it, obviously it's now working. But uh, yeah. I hope um, I sorry I missed your presentation, Rose. Um, it's okay. <laughs> when I when I when I sort of disappeared there, uh, we were just about getting to the questions to Bob. But I would like to ask Bob if he could repeat the answer to the very first question that I think Tulio asked, and that was the difference between herbicide resistance and herbicide tolerance. I think that was the question. Can you give me a playback, on, a quick playback on that, Bob? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I guess it depends if we're talking about crops or we're talking about weeds. Um, if we're talking about crops that have been developed to now be resistant to a herbicide such as glyphosate, there really is no difference between uh, a Roundup ready resistant corn and a Roundup ready tolerant corn. So those terms can be used interchangeably. So, okay. Good. So if we're talking about tolerance and resistance when it comes to weeds, I mean, um, you know, if we apply a herbicide on a weed, um, you know, it's just, it just is, it's not controlled, then that's just a, a level of tolerance, right? But if it was controlled with a herbicide for many years, and then all of a sudden it's not a being controlled by that herbicide, then we say it's now resistant to that herbicide. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. So, so a little bit of difference between whether we're speaking about crops or weeds. Okay, we've got a couple of final questions here. Maria, Amelia first, and then Maria Paula. Maria, Amelia, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And my question is, how long does it take for insects to control the wheat? And apart from the weather, what else does the control time depend on? Oh, yeah, very good questions. Uh, well, it really depends on the, uh, you know, the biocontrol agent and weed system. Uh, like with the hound's tongue, that was as fast as I've ever seen a biocontrol agent work. Uh, you know, normally you're looking at in an order of, you know, six to 10 years before you see local patch level control. And remember, it doesn't eradicate you know the 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 weed which is what you want because you want the uh, plant to be present as food so that the agent remains in the environment uh ready for if the weed take increases in number again the uh, agent is already present and able to increase as well but uh but yeah that you know that's a a rare example that works uh like for the house tongue it worked within three years. We were say, seeing very dramatic reductions in, in the weed within three years where it was uh, released. And uh, it, you know, it took, yeah, it took a couple of decades for, for it to be a more regional level control, but I would say that we're there now. Like Alberta announced that they're not going to be uh, giving people the biocontrol agent this year, like they have a program where they, where they give um, interested uh, ranchers the biocontrol agent uh, to apply, and uh, because hound's tongue is under control in most in most areas um, in Alberta, um, yeah, like it's it's controlled, like it's wonderful, you know. So, uh, yeah, and then your second question. Oh, sorry, could you repeat it again? Uh, uh, a part of the weather, what, oh, what else does the control yeah. time depend on? Right. Uh, well, like in ecology, you know, like the environment uh, plays an important role, but, but biotic factors can also play a role. Um, like, for instance, there might be native uh, parasitoids or parasitic insects that, that might uh, find the, the biocontrol agent, especially when its numbers get high, um, and, and they might control the biocontrol agent. So, you know, there's all these other factors that are difficult to predict, um, you know, including, um, including cows eating your, your, uh, 
your buyer control agent that I just mentioned with that one gall farmer on yellow toe flax. Um, I wouldn't have anticipated that, right? But, you know, there's always something in ecology. There's so many different factors that influence every interaction that occurs. And, uh, and yeah, um, yes, but, uh, but it, I think that climate is really important, especially for our buyer control agents. Uh, a cold weather as well. And we try, we try to match uh, climatically the areas in where we get the insects in Europe to where we're going to be placing them in, in North America or in Canada. But, uh, but yeah, cold, uh, cold winters can be killers. Okay, great. Uh, I think our final question this, this evening goes to Maria Paula. You still have a question there, Maria, before I turn it back to Rick to close us down this evening. Maria Paula said that uh, uh, she's in a bad connection. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll have to wait for her question later. So I guess, Rick, do you want to wrap it up? Sure. Thanks, Wayne. Um, thanks, Bob. Rose for wonderful pre presentations today. I apologize again, Rose, that I missed yours, but I do have your slide deck here, so I can okay. go back and, and review it. And I may throw a question or two at you, but really thanks for both of your presentations today. And I hope that our participants, our seven that were on the line today, uh, also can say that they learned something. And I've seen a few comments in the chat that would indicate that. Thanks to Brian and Wayne for picking up the slack when I disappeared unexpectedly and unannounced uh, for um, managing the chat and uh, moving it forward. So our next session is on Friday, four o'clock. Um, it's our Friday recap. I wanna show you that video that I tried to show you on Monday about um, some farmers that I personally have worked with and worked for. Uh, with the Alberta uh, Bar Wheat and Barley Commissions, uh, and a very nice video they put together. Then we're going to go back and just have a quick review of what was shared with us uh, on insect disease and weed uh, management. And I intend to ask each of you a question about your key learning. So you might want to think about that as a bit of homework. Um, to think of a question that uh, something that you took away from this uh, these two sessions this week, and then after that uh, we'll take a quick, very quick look at what's planned for next week, and then we will. Um, I look forward to hearing uh, agriculture back home from the Brazilians' perspective. I think that's going to be very exciting, and then of course uh, we'll wrap up and um, get ready for next week. So. Thanks everybody, I really appreciate your time and, and uh, participation in today's webinar and um, have a good rest of your week and we'll see the participants. And of course, Bob and Rose, if you wanna sit in and listen what's going on and maybe you might even get some more questions, you're more than welcome to join us on Friday at four o'clock, same, same uh, exact same link as what you've used to join us today. Thanks everybody, take care and we'll um, see you soon. Thanks.